the Queen Consort and the newly titled Prince of Wales heard the formal announcement of the Queen's death and the proclamation to be agreed. My Lords, it is my sad duty to inform you that Her Most Gracious Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, has passed away. With one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord. Bless his majesty with long and happy years to reign over us. God save the king. God save the king. Privy councillors then moved to the throne room to hear from the new king. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, it is my most sorrowful duty to announce to you the death of my beloved mother, the Queen. My mother's reign was unequalled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and in carrying out the heavy task that has been laid upon me and to which I now dedicate what remains to me of my life. I pray for the guidance and help of Almighty God. I have with humble duty to crave your majesty's permission for the publication of your gracious speech. Approved. Although he's now Supreme Governor of the Church of England, law requires him to swear an oath to protect the Protestant faith in Scotland, where church and state are separate. I, Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of my other realms and territories, King, Defender of the Faith, do faithfully promise and swear that I shall inviolably maintain and preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws made in Scotland. The oath was then signed, a moment of frustration as some pens are in his way. He now signs Charles R. Rex King. There were two more proclamations to be approved, one for a bank holiday on the day of the Queen's funeral. Approved. Two more signatures required. The King says, away, annoyed again by inkstands and pens cluttering the table. On their way out, all were asked to sign the proclamation. Pens, it seems, again an issue. The agreed words then, by centuries-old tradition, proclaimed to a crowd whose iPhones pinged them the news two days ago. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory. The proclamation was repeated in the City of London. The Crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. God save the King! God save the King! Three cheers for His Majesty the King! Hip hip! The King was cheered on his way back to Buckingham Palace, where he would meet Liz Truss again and members of her new cabinet, including the Chancellor, whose plans for a major tax announcement have been thrown by the period of mourning for the late Queen. There was a hand on the arm from the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, when he met the King, who also met with the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davey. 
Speaking at the Accession Council earlier, the King repeated the promise he gave in his TV address to the nation last night to stay out of politics. But some who've known him well through his years as Prince of Wales, campaigning on issues like the environment, say he's a man of even stronger opinions than people realise. You didn't always get the full story about how much he was concerned about some of these things. What you got in the media and elsewhere was a kind of modulated version of it. OK, controversial, opinionated, but not necessarily the full story. For me, that demonstrated a kind of restraint, but don't look for guarantees. He's his own man with extremely strong convictions about things, and he won't stop short of letting the politicians know what they are. The weekly audience with the Prime Minister could be a different be, sort of conversation. Could be very different. I swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God. In the Commons, the Speaker was amongst those who swore an oath of allegiance to the King. On a rare Saturday sitting, there were more tributes to the Queen. But when these finish this evening, Parliament is expected to be suspended for the remainder of the period of mourning. Preparations are already underway for the lengthy queues expected when the Queen's body will lie in state in Westminster Hall. The timing for a new government wanting to make emergency provisions at a time of crisis are excruciating. But protocols and respect for the monarchy mean you won't hear a minister say that. Well, in the past few minutes, the new Prince of Wales has paid tribute to the Queen in a statement released by Kensington Palace. He said, she was by my side at my happiest moments and she was by my side during the saddest days of my life. I knew this day would come, but it will be some time before the reality of life without Granny will truly feel real. And he went on, I will honour her memory by supporting my father, the King, in every way I can. Well, let's go live now to our political editor, Gary Gibbon, who is in Westminster. Gary, yesterday we learned a lot from what the King said in his address. What have we learned today from the accession? We've learned what an accession council looks like. Nobody's ever peered into uh, one of these before. And what an extraordinary event it was. Uh, some of the most senior uh, office holders who are Privy Council officers, uh, uh, in, uh, members of the Privy Council in one room, extraordinary familiar faces, a sort of Madame Tussauds of the British establishment uh, there. And then suddenly this hushed moment uh, when uh, the, the business begins and goodness is it arcane. It was an act of modernisation really that uh, the King allowed cameras to come in uh, to the Accession Council and the Privy Council that followed. Uh, that was a big first, but goodness, what an arcane series of uh, things we then saw, including things like the oath uh, which in the second meeting, the Privy Council meeting, uh, the King swears to maintain the Protestant religion in Scotland. So uh, re really quite a spectacle to observe in the 21st uh, century. Uh, will it give people comfort, a sense of tradition, or will they scratch their heads and think some of the language uh, is, is, is a bit bonkers. It's, it's, it's hard to know, but the sense in the streets around uh, London is that people are tuning in, watching, coming to see in person what they can. We also learnt, though, in the words that uh, the King chose to address those great and the good in, in front of him, uh, that he really does want to hammer home this message that he's going to be a constitutional monarch, just like his mother was, properly respecting the conventions of constitutional monarchy and not interfering in politics. It is telling yet again that, as he did in the address uh, on TV last night, he feels the need to say that. Maybe we also saw in that accession uh, uh, council and the Privy Council that followed a little glimpse of the King himself. Uh, you can't imagine seeing Queen Elizabeth II make that little gesture with the pen stand that uh, King Charles did. He comes to the throne at the age of 73 and he might be quite set in his ways, he might often have behaved like that, but the camera is capturing it there and that is something 
you wonder whether the Prince of Wales, newly entitled, standing behind him, thought that's something he's going to have to uh, try to moderate a bit. There's also one other thing we actually learned, a bit of policy, that we are uh, going to have a bank holiday, it was always expected, but a bank holiday on the day of Queen Elizabeth II's funeral and we await confirmation of when that day is but it looks like it might be a week on Monday. Gary what about the business of government the Prime Minister and the Cabinet seem totally occupied with all the events which will go on for many days but there is still a cost of living crisis there was a protest in central London today about a fatal police shooting all of the issues and problems within Britain remain is the government functioning? Ministers insist that it is functioning, but as you know, we were uh, halfway through a debate about the government's extraordinary uh, intervention in energy markets uh, when uh, we heard about the death of the Queen, and that is extraordinary momentous policy, which hasn't really been challenged and poked in the way that it normally would be. I got the sense that the briefings on that policy, uh, that the ink was barely dry on it and there were an awful lot of holes in it. Maybe uh, government is slightly relieved to have a, a time where everybody's looking elsewhere. But it is not having time to uh, put legislation through the Commons. They're going to uh, rise at the end of the uh, debate today, it, that's the intention, and not come back until after the Queen's funeral. Gary Gibbon in Westminster. Well, with me here now is Dame Martina Milburn, Chief Executive of the Prince's Trust, an organisation very close to King Charles's heart. So what happens to it now? Does it become the King's Trust? Does the Prince of Wales take over? What, what, what happens? Um, it doesn't become the King's Trust. It's staying as the Prince's Trust and His Majesty will stay as our President. And so he will remain intimately involved, will he, with the organisation? Because this is an organisation in which he, he has a direct link to some of the most um, underprivileged and disadvantaged people in Britain. Well, when you say intimately involved, he hasn't been involved in the sort of running of the charity for years and years and years and years. So the charity has evolved like everything evolves. So when I came in 20 years ago, for example, he used to come to trustees meetings. He hasn't done that for 15 years. So he's been taking a step back for a long time. So this is just part of the evolution of the charity. And what we're really about, as you say, is helping disadvantaged young people. Right. But you've, you've worked with him for yeah. many years. Yeah. So you can give us some insight into how he will be king. I think he'll be a fantastic king. I mean, the thing about the, His Majesty, I was about to say the Prince of Wales, the thing about His Majesty is he's a people person and people matter to him, he's interested in people. So after the Tottenham riots, myself and His Majesty and actually the Queen Consort, we all went to Tottenham. He spent at least two or three hours sitting, listening to young people about their lives, about why they'd rioted, about what would make a difference to them. And I don't think that interest in people will change. What, what about the behaviour? Will he still have the freedom to do that kind of thing, to be as nimble as that? You know, is it different for the King to go to Tottenham than it is for the Prince of Wales? Yes, it is different for the King. And he's very well aware of the constraints of being King compared to being the Prince of Wales. So he's got all that in hand. He will know what's appropriate and what isn't. But I don't think it'll lessen his interest in what's happening to the people of this country and actually around the Commonwealth. What about his famously strongly held convictions? I mean, are these things that he will have to hide or will he just keep them behind closed doors or how, how will he operate? How does he operate? I don't think he's ever hidden anything, which is why we're all aware of what his opinions are. But he's very well aware of the difference between being Prince of Wales and being the King. So what he is not going to do is get involved in constitutional matters. He's not going to overstep the line there. He totally understands what that difference means. But the line is not sort of drawn in you know in, in, in indelible ink it's a it's an idea really isn't it and I suppose it's an idea that can change and can evolve it's as to where that line is precisely it is an idea that can change and evolve but I don't think it will be doing that in the sort of near future uh, he's had a very long apprenticeship 
I mean, an enormously long apprenticeship, and he's learned from his mother. He understands the job he's taking on. Well, one of the most influential roles that, as Prince of Wales, he was able to perform was his convening power. And this was not something that was often seen in public. It wasn't covered by the, the media because the cameras were never in, invited in. But he would bring together people from opposite sides of the fences on things, whether it's energy companies and climate change activists, which was supposed to happen this week, or all sorts of other issues. Um, does that become too political for him as king? Or do you think he can continue to convene groups of people to try and resolve problems? I think it totally depends on the issue, and I think it totally depends on how he does it. So one of the things that he has done incredibly well, and is very well known, is his support, for example, for the Muslim community. And he has brought different factions of the Muslim communities together, so they always see him as an honest broker. I think it would be a huge loss to this country if that sort of support for the communities we have were to go. Whether he's allowed to do that, I, I don't know. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a mere servant. I mean, obviously, no, nobody will, will, will comment or criticise at this stage on anything political. But even yesterday, when he talked about this being a country of many cultures and many faiths already, even that is a sort of a controversial area to, to discuss. You know, it's almost a sort of an endorsement of multiculturalism, I suppose. Um, he's confident in saying these things, isn't he, I suppose, is my point. He is confident in that, and actually he's always been an enormous fan of the disadvantaged. He's been a person who said, actually, there are things we can do different to, differently to help you, which is why he started the Prince's Trust in the first place. You know, in those days, in 1976, everyone thought these awful young people would run off with his money. They didn't, and actually he's changed the lives of over a million young people just in the UK. And when you go on overseas trips with him, he embraces the cultures he's going into. I can't see any of that changing, and personally, Personally, I think that is a really good thing. Dame Martina Milburn, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, now let's go to Jackie Long, who is at Balmoral. Well, this is the last full day that the Queen will lie in rest here at Balmoral and hundreds and hundreds of people have joined the long slow queue coming over Balmoral Bridge down the road to leave flowers and tributes at the gate. Now, senior royals have remained firmly behind the gates up until today. Around two o'clock, they drove out to a small private prayer service at Crathy Kirk, the church that the Queen loved to visit and to attend when she was here at Balmoral. Now, on the way back, they got out of the car, Princess Anne and her family, the Duke of York and his daughters, the Wessexes, to speak briefly with well-wishers. Just felt like we wanted to be near the Queen and um, I brought my son and my daughter. And they'll be smiling, but inside they'll be as upset as what we are. And so it's really difficult for them to come out and put a brave face on. I think it leaves a big hole in everybody's life and I think there's a, there's a pull to people now to come and pay their respects. Well, after that, they went down to look at the flowers and read some of the messages that have been left over the last couple of days. And it was clearly quite an emotional moment for some of the younger members of the royal family. Now, as they went to return back inside the estate, they stopped paused briefly and waved at the crowds and there was a ripple of gentle applause for them. Clearly, the crowds appreciated them coming out today. Now, the Queen remains inside Balmoral this evening. Her coffin will begin its long final journey to the funeral in London tomorrow, but stopping...